Today is August 23, 2020. Welcome to the 39.6 Facebook Live Finance Show. Today's episode number 49. Should I invest in a real estate fund or a real estate syndication? The 39.6 Facebook Live Finance Show is the show that teaches you how to make your money work for you so you don't have to work for your money. Talk investing, taxes, real estate, Airbnb, syndications, and even the car you drive. We've had a lot of growth in our Facebook group. We're up to around 410 members or so today. So that is awesome. Well on our way to hit 500. Please invite friends and we'll get there promptly. We also sent out an email today to all of our subscribers with our most recent 506C syndication opportunity. If you did not get that email, please sign up on the Facebook group, uh, sign up sheet for syndications. If you're out there and you can see me, hear me, please let me know. Oh, thank you very much, Facebook user. All right, so now we don't have to do a whole syndication and then do it again because the audio didn't work. I did not yet fire BeLive, but I will soon enough. I really wanna try Restream. I'm excited about that. Okay, so should I invest in a real estate fund or a syndication? This is a very common question, and I'm gonna highlight some of the differences. They're really more similar than they are different, okay? And it is real estate, and it is, in general, a very passive way to invest in real estate. But there are some differences, and we will uh, highlight those. Thank you very much, uh, Facebook user from San Antonio. Good to see you. I do not get to see the people who are actually commenting, uh, which is one of the reasons I want to switch over to Restream. We have six people here. It is Sunday night, so hopefully we'll have a decent crowd. Okay, so I'll put this back up here. Should I invest in a real estate fund or a syndication? Okay, so just briefly, a syndication is an investment in one single property or one single investment. Okay, it's usually just one property that you're investing in you, and you'll get an offering memorandum, sign a private placement memorandum, similar to what I discussed yesterday in episode 48. Okay, when you invest in a fund, a blind fund, you are putting your money into an account and the people who are managing that fund will then choose how to invest the money in whatever assets. All right. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for coming by. Glad to see you here. Um, you and your wife, uh, we need to meet up sometime and talk real estate and other things. So glad you're here. Okay. So funds, they will often have a number of assets in there, like five or maybe 10 assets all in one, one account. And you just invest your money at the front end. Sometimes they'll have multiple rounds of funding and then it will close. Sometimes you have a fund that's just open and allows people to go in and out, okay? Uh, a syndication for a single investment is you're in for that investment and you are out when the investment is closed, okay? So that is just kind of the overview. But now kind of go into the nitty gritties. Diversi diversification is the number one reason why funds can be an attractive investment to investors. Okay, if you invest in a fund, then you get to see uh, your money get Im immediately or over time spread across a number of assets. So the likelihood of you losing all of your money is definitely lower in a fund than it is in a syndication. Um, if you're just looking strictly based on that information alone, certainly you could invest in a number of poor assets and in a fund and it could still go broke or just have, you know, one, one property in a fund that ruins it for everything else. Okay. But you get diversification. And so diversification is one way to mitigate your risk. Now, syndications, if you're investing in a number of syndications over time, you're going to get that diversification anyhow. Okay. But, uh, a fund is a one-stop shop for diversification, okay? Now, the minimums, the minimum amount into a syndication, the lowest I've seen is $25,000. Syndications usually try to minimize the number of people just because it's 
makes it more work ultimately to have more people. Uh, this is different from like crowdfunding where minimums can be like $5,000, $10,000 and they can have hundreds or maybe even thousands of people. Okay. Syndications usually are, are smaller. Now the minimums for a fund usually don't get quite that small because $25,000 and if they're going to buy five assets, they're not really getting that much money invested in each asset. They need to have a lot of people. And uh, again, it's just usually easier to manage something with less people. Okay. So often funds will have like 50 to a hundred or even 200 or more as a minimum amount. Okay. Um, so that's another thing. Asset management. Okay. Now this is a big one. Uh, and to me, this is one of the biggest reasons why uh, I favor syndications um, from a purely investor standpoint. And that is when you invest in a syndication, you're investing in a single asset and there will often be fees on the acquisition on the front end to the people who are running the project. And then there will be fees going on throughout the project of some sorts, but you're not getting an additional layer of external fees on an ongoing basis, usually. Now, any syndication can run it however it wants to, but in general, the investments that I come across will have an acquisition fee at the front end, but then during the hold, there aren't additional fees diluting your investment, okay? In a fund, the same thing with like a hedge fund, money, the capital's in there and there's cap there's cash in the fund account. And over time, every year, however it's designed or every quarter, they're taking out that asset management fee directly and giving it to the sponsors. And this can be above and beyond the asset management fee for managing the individual asset. This is just like the fund management fee rather. Okay, so there could be a management fee that the sponsors are charging uh, in order to manage the individual assets at the asset level, which you can have in a syndication, but there can be an additional layer at the fund level. Okay. And so I was looking up some fund fees like origin investments. There's just like 1.5% on an annual basis above and beyond all the other fees. One and a half percent is a lot. I mean, when you're looking for an 8% return, 1.5% um, is, is a lot of 8%, right? So they will often have a preferred rate of return in either direction for, for either syndication or a fund. But when you're taking 1.5% of invested capital on the front end before taking into consideration the earnings, uh, it can be really hard to meet that preferred rate of return. Um, so that preferred rate of return if we go back to my previous uh, episode number uh, 44 and talk about preferred rates of return, when I talk about the sponsors only getting paid distributions after the preferred is met, that is the distributions, which is the profits of the individual asset, okay? In a fund, that would be the profits of the fund. However, asset management or fund management, those are fees that come out in advance, the same way that expenses come out. So they do get that money paid to them regardless of how the asset is performing. So you might have a pref of 12% and it may never get there, but the sponsors can still be getting paid very well because they're charging it as fees as opposed to getting distributions. So that amount of the fee can be substantial over a five year period of time adding one and a half percent over five years, that's seven and a half percent. So that can be substantial. Okay, now selectivity. In a syndication, you get to choose your individual asset. This is kind of like choosing an individual stock to invest in. In a fund, you don't have any choice. It gets chosen for you. It's kind of like a, an actively managed mutual fund where the fund managers pick the individual assets. So you have to put in uh, an additional layer of trust in the sponsors when you're investing in a fund because you're just giving them money and you're just trusting them to invest it 
to the best of their ability with that money, as opposed to at least with a syndication, you know exactly where your money is going. You are on that private placement memorandum and you can look at the, you know, the public documents that say what entity has purchased that property. And that's very transparent. Okay. Or at least more transparent than within a fund. Okay. Knowledge of the deal um, in a syndication. All of the syndications that I invest in, we get regular updates, usually monthly, but at least quarterly on individual assets. You're probably going to get updates on the fund in a fund, um, but in a syndication, because your asset is your investment is at the asset level, they give you a lot more detailed information about the goings on of that property as well as the financials. So I routinely get the profit and loss statements, uh, often the the balance sheet and the uh, rent rolls for each property every month. In a fund with like 10 properties, it's much less likely they're going to give you that much detail. They might give you kind of comprehensive detail or information at the fund level, but not likely as much at the individual asset level. Okay. Now the K1s, you are going to get a K1 every year while you're in a fund or every year that you're in a syndication. So that part is the same. You're going to get a lot of negative numbers in general. However, in a fund, they could invest in a lot of different assets in different states. And that can make your tax returns much more complicated. You could have to file a tax return in every single state that an individual asset is invested in. So from a complexity standpoint, that might not be as much worth worthwhile. I mean, if you have to file in like 10 states and you have to pay for a state filing in every one, um, you could be paying hundreds of dollars for every state filing and it might just not be worth it because you don't have that much capital invested. You could have $50,000 into a fund and be getting paid 8% and get $4,000 a year. But now you're paying like over a thousand dollars in state filing fees. Um, that really much very very much dilutes uh, your cash on cash return. Okay, so that's something to be cognizant of. Texas and Florida are no state tax states, so that is one benefit if you have funds like that. I haven't necessarily seen funds where they've told people in advance that they are isolating it to like no state tax states or otherwise, um, because they probably want to have full freedom to invest wherever they wherever the money is. Um, but it would be interesting if those funds existed. They, they probably do exist to some extent. I just don't, I'm just not aware of them. Okay. But you have to take that into consideration and see where they are investing. Now, um, looking at it from the other side, not as an investor. Okay. If I were, uh, if I had the choice of managing a blind fund or managing a individual syndication, well, it's pretty nice to be managing a blind fund because you just get money and you're going to get paid pretty much no matter what, you're going to get a percentage of that money. Now you're going to get paid more if you perform better, but you're still going to get paid likely. Well, like if I raised, Oh, $200 million in cash. Okay. And I had a 2% asset or 2% fund management fee as $4 million a year going to, my fund. That's a lot of money um, without having to actually perform. I could have all of the investments not meet the preferred rate of return, but I'm still getting $4 million. That sounds awesome. Okay. If I'm sponsoring a syndication, I may get some money on the front end, but then I'm not really getting much of anything unless I perform. So there's a strong impetus to perform in both situations, but more so on the syndication side. Um, and having the blind fund as a sponsor is just fantastic because if you get that, you get that fund management fee plus asset management fees, you can just make, make a killing. Okay. Now you can't just open up a fund and raise $200 million. You need to have, uh, the reputation to, to get that kind of capital. Um, but if you think about it from the other side, then, um, Obviously, uh, there's a lot of benefits of having a fund instead of an individual deal that you have to raise money on. Now, there are people on that other side who have both 
funds, but also have syndications, individual ones. Now, when an individual deal comes along and they look at it and they make a choice, should I get this deal and use my blind fund to fund it or should I do it as a syndication? Okay, now think about how they would decide which one goes into the blind fund or which one goes into a syndication. Now in the blind fund, they're using capital that's already available to them. So they know they can make it happen. In a syndication, they would have to raise the capital each time. Okay, so if there's a deal that's softer, like not as good, they might struggle more raising it in a syndication. Okay, whereas a uh, deal that's an awesome deal with great numbers, it will potentially be easier to raise that money in a syndication. Okay, so the softer deals are less likely to be in a syndication and more likely to go to the fund because they already have that money and they have to invest it. Otherwise, that money is just kind of sitting in that bank account earning zero. It has to get deployed somewhere. Okay, so there's a motivation in a fund to get the money off the books. And there's a motivation in a syndication to get good deals where then you can raise capital because the, the numbers work out that people will be excited to invest money. So if you think about it from that perspective, and not necessarily that's going to be the case in all situations, but just from that perspective alone, if somebody were to have a choice on the other side, the best deals are the ones that they're are going to be going onto the syndicated side. Okay. So these are a lot of different things to think about when making that choice. Now I have only invested in syndications and I have made a lot of money in syndications uh, and I work with syndications. So I have, um, uh, a conflict of interest to some extent. I wish I managed a fund though. Uh, that would be awesome to be on that side of the, uh, of the coin on a fund. Um, all right. So that's it. I'm going to, I have a lot of comments here. So, uh, hello to, um, Simon. Yes. Uh, great to see you again here. It's, it's crazy that people you just randomly meet, uh, one day having breakfast outside your apartment and then they become um, people that you continue to uh, have relationships with in the future and see on Facebook groups and on these calls. Um, interested to know about my company and track record reference to our syndicated offering. Um, we're going to do something separate for our, the offering on a separate likely a private call with details to be uh, announced in the future. Um, if you're on the email, then you will get that information likely in the next upcoming few days. Um, and I can talk to you offline. Very happy to. Okay. That will be it for today for episode 49. Tomorrow is episode 50. Um, we should do something special for episode number 50. I don't actually have plans yet, but I can't believe we're already at 50. Um, we've done, I guess we've done 20 episodes now in two and a half weeks. So that's pretty exciting. Uh, I've been excited to see the growth of our group. Again, please invite your friends and thank you to our sponsors, the Medicine, Marriage and Money podcast coming to you in September. I think that is it. And again, as my disclaimer, none of this is legal financial or other advice it's just talk on the screen all right until tomorrow peace, peace.